All right, so let's shift the conversation a little bit to Shane Steichen. And let me just start this off by saying I absolutely love Shane Steichen. From the second they hired him and I looked at his resume, it cannot be argued. This guy is a young, offensive mastermind between what he did with the Chargers and what he did with the Eagles. And ultimately what he's done with the Colts so far, at least from what we see, is really something special. And we talk so much about Anthony Richardson being a rookie, but I feel like we don't say the same thing about Shane Steichen, and sure, he's not a rookie to the NFL, but he is a rookie head coach, and it's easy to kind of forget that when we're thinking about the number four overall pick in our quarterback, right? Listen, I don't know all the minutia of the differences between being an offensive coordinator and a head coach, but I can tell you that I would assume it has something to do with the fact that there's a bit more on your plate as a head coach, considering you're responsible for all facets of the game as opposed to just your side of the football. And I had a conversation with Kent Sterling not that long ago. You could go ahead and take a look at it. It was probably about three weeks, a month ago, the great Kent Sterling. And I had asked him what was different about this training camp with Shane Steichen, seeing it for the first time, as opposed to what he had seen in all of his time watching Frank Reich in Indianapolis. And what he said is that the team is punctual, the energy is different, and the attention to detail is different. And I'd like to believe it just showed. And I know I said maybe this was all about Steichen, but I want to talk about Anthony Richardson quick because it goes back to Steichen. And I cannot believe some of the negativity around Anthony Richardson's first start. Now, don't get me wrong. The overwhelming consensus, of course, is that Anthony Richardson had a great game for a rookie quarterback in his first start because most of us have two eyes. But apparently, there's some knuckleheads out there that might not be watching what we're watching Or maybe they just don't understand what they just saw. So allow me to let you know what you just saw in case you didn't realize it, okay? This is a guy in Anthony Richardson that was considered to be a project quarterback that was not accurate. I mean, full disclosure myself, I did a deep dive. I watched film on all the quarterbacks in this rookie draft. And Richardson, I didn't have very high on my list. Now, if I knew what I knew about his character and his work ethic, I probably would have had him a bit higher. But as far as the tape went, It was iffy, and I couldn't even find like a 10-yard hitch on his tape. So this was a guy that obviously had a lot of questions coming out of college. Now, he walked into week one, the second youngest rookie quarterback to start a week one game in the history of football, okay? I don't know who number one on that list is. I would assume it's probably Zach Wilson or Sam Darnold. That being true, he had more completions and less turnovers than Andrew Luck and Peyton Manning in their first starts, which therefore is the most completions by a rookie quarterback in their first start in the history of the Indianapolis Colts. The offense scored two touchdowns. He accounted for them both. He led the team in rushing while his best running back had 13 carries for 14 yards and two fumbles. They couldn't run worth a lick, okay? So 65% completion percentage, all of this again being the second youngest quarterback in the history of football to start a week one game. So when I put it in that perspective, what else could you have possibly wanted from Anthony Richardson in this game? I mean, if you really thought it was that bad of a performance, you don't have to say it out loud. You've been exposed. You don't understand the game of football, and that's totally fine. I'm here to educate you on it, and I only bring up that with Anthony Richardson because we could talk about how great that is for Richardson all we want, and what a testament that is to him, but I'd like to bring it back around to Steichen, which is really my entire point, is that's a testament to the great Shane Steichen and what he did. So while we have critiques of the game, and I'm going to get into it a little bit as to some of the play calling and really more so the situational football, let, let, let's acknowledge the fact that what we just saw out of Anthony Richardson can potentially for some people be fully credited to Shane Steichen. But I'd like to give Anthony some credit as well, but I'd like to point that out because the rest of the episode is going to be me questioning Shane Steichen on some level. So what we're going to be talking about today is mostly the fourth down conversions that we went for. We were one of five on the day. And I know the new NFL is all about going through it on fourth down and the analytics guys and this, that, and the next. But it does raise an interesting discussion about situational football. When is it right to take the points? 
versus when it's right to go for it. Of course, hindsight's always going to be 2020, but nonetheless, this is a discussion to have. So let's get into it. But before we do, let me just quickly introduce myself for those of you who have never been here before. My name is Justin, and this right here is the Riding the Bench Colts cast. As always, if you are enjoying it, go ahead, shoot it a like. It's going to help me get out to as many Colts fans as humanly possible. It's going to be a big season over here at Riding the Bench. I can promise you that. I'm looking to be one of the biggest Colts podcasts on all of planet Earth. If you want to help me get there, that like is the first step. If you've already done that and you're looking for another way to help, or perhaps you're a returning listener, subscribing is another great way to help me and also make sure that you are listening to the episodes that you seem to be enjoying. The second that they come out, you're going to know about it. The goal for now is to get to 2,000 subscribers, and then from there it'll be three, so on and so forth. We're somewhere in the 1400s as I record this, but that's neither here nor there. Subscribe if you like. But now let's just get into some of these conversions. I don't know how long the episode is going to be, but uh, you know, I just want to talk about each of them individually. So I want to start with the first one we did, right? In the second quarter, following that big collision from Kenny Moore, and uh, it was Kenny Moore and Dallas Flowers, right? Thank goodness they both got back into the game. That was a scary moment for a team that is depleted at corner or, or we thought was depleted at corner. More on that maybe later in the week. We thought we were depleted at corner, and, and that was a scary moment for us. And then here comes Tony Brown, picks off Trevor Lawrence and brings it back to the Jacksonville 25. Now, in the NFL, it is very, very rare that you start in the other team's territory, let alone practically in the red zone. The red zone starts at the 20-yard line. Of course, we start at their 25. We go four and out, okay? And on fourth and one, we do the Shane Steichen patented QB sneak. And, and in all fairness to Shane Steichen, that thing was uh, so automatic that the league was considering outlawing it coming into this season. So I understand that. That being said, the difference between what they did in Philly and what we just did here in Indianapolis is that, you know, it would have been nice to have some bigger guys behind Richardson. I believe it was Ogletree and Deion Jackson that were pushing Richardson. It would have been nice to maybe have tossed a lineman in there and Drew Ogletree as well, or at least two tight ends at the minimum. Oh, that was really just shocking that we didn't get that conversion, but we didn't. So we started Jacksonville's 25 and we come out of it with zero points. Zilch. Okay. And I understand that we're in a game against the division favorite. We're an underdog. We haven't won a game at home, or rather in week one, in now 10 straight years. Going into the game, it was nine. So I totally understand in this situation, trying to steal possession. I understand that perspective. But then as you go, of course, the cross of the game, or you go through the course of the game, did I word that right? It doesn't matter. We'll move past it. As the game continues, you're saying not for anything, what would have happened if we had just taken the points here and there, this was a huge critique with Frank Reich as well. And I know there's the analytics guys up there uh, in, in the uh, in the press box, making decisions, making calls. What's the percentage we get this on this conversion right here? Point being is you do wonder at what point you put that aside and take the points because that's starting inside the Jacksonville 25, zero points on that. Now you go into the second quarter again, right? We get the ball at the Jacksonville 48. We go four and out once again. This time, I believe even more questionable than the first one because at least that was fourth and one. Shane Steichen has really an infamous fourth and one play in that QB sneak. It is fourth and four, and we're at Jacksonville's 42. That is a 59-yard field goal. Now, that's a long field goal, but we pass up a 59-yard field goal. Ball gets batted down at the line. On a, on a throw to Pittman, and there was really off the top of my head. No one open on that play. I remember I was watching all of Richardson's throws and runs. I was watching every snap of Richardson. NFL was kind enough to upload that. I'll be doing a film breakdown later in the week. I have to watch again. I think there was a possibility that Josh Downs was on like a deep out, and he was at least in single coverage because Pittman was blanketed. But that's a situation when you're passing up a 59-yard field goal, and that becomes relevant. Because on the next time we get the ball, or at least maybe not the next time we get the ball. Now I'm just talking out my ass. But in the third quarter, we have another four and out and pass up a 59-yard field goal again on a toss to Deion Jackson, who couldn't do anything the entire game, which gets blown up, looked like a disaster from the start, and he fumbles to make it even worse. Now, you look at that, right? We were up 14-7 to going into the half. If we had taken the 59-yard field goal in the second quarter, it's possible we would have been up 17-7. to And then again in the third quarter, we could have been up 
once more, or at least tied it. I forget the score. My point in saying that is we paid Matt Gay $22 million over the course of four years to fix the kicker situation after Chase McLaughlin gave us really, really good work last year. It's one thing to go for it on fourth and inches or fourth and one with a QB sneak that was literally converting at an 80 or 90% rate last year, but a fourth and four, and then after not having converted that entire time to do a toss to Deion Jackson to the outside instead of, I mean, Lord, try the QB sneak again on fourth and one. Do something, or why not just take the points? Why not just take the points? We paid the kicker. Hell, let's use them, right? Let's use them and get the points. Chase McLaughlin, as good as he was, he didn't have a 59-yard leg. Okay, Matt Gay, the reason we got him is because he has converted on over 90% of his field goals in the past two seasons and has a leg that can literally hit from past 60 with relative ease, at least in terms of distance. He's good for that. Now, I, I listen, if anyone missed the question, I watched Shane Sykin's media availability. My question is, was that like out of Matt Gay's range? If you've ever been to a game before, you see the kickers kicking before the game starts and they're practicing. And a lot of times teams use that as a gauge as to kind of what decisions they're going to make in the middle of a game. Was he just not looking good from that distance in pregame? Someone has to ask the Lord, if I was a reporter, I'd be getting these answers. But unfortunately, I don't think anyone asked it or I certainly didn't see it. But for me, at some point, you have to look at Shane Steichen and say, hey, we get your aggressive and we understand the percentages of going for it. I understand you want to steal a game from Jacksonville, and I understand everything that's on the line, but we paid this kicker. Mind you, one of the only people we paid this entire offseason was this kicker. We're talking Matt Gay, Samson Ibakam, and we just extended Luke Rhodes. Those were the big money moves while we have a running back sitting on the sideline who I think is hurt, apparently could pass a physical on the first week of being on the PUP. He's just fine, and we haven't paid him, and our running game literally averaged like 1.1 yards per carry, even less right? So it's, for me, this is aggravating. Are you guys as aggravated about this as I am? This was aggravating to me. Now, ultimately, kicking these two field goals wouldn't have made a huge difference, at least when you look at the scoreboard at face value. I'd have to maybe go back and analyze the entire game, which I probably won't do, to be honest with you. I'd have to go back and analyze the entire game. It's possible that having three points here and three points there could have changed something that Jacksonville did situationally. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I, I'm just kind of, you know, putting it out there just to get your mind flowing a little bit. At some point, you have to take the points. How many times did we have that problem with Frank Reich? And here we are seeing it all over again. Now, I am not saying that Shane Steichen is Frank Reich, but there are similarities in their approach. I ultimately think Shane Steichen is just kind of like a sharper guy in, in terms of his intensity, his tenacity, and really just his energy and his ability to relate to the players. So I don't want to make this like I'm comparing the two of them and saying he's the same guy. But some of the pitfalls that we had in this game were the same things that we were seeing under Frank Reich, and I just don't want it to go unnoticed. I don't want to trash uh, Shane Sykin. I'm just telling you like it is. This would have been 31-27, to 27, assuming Matt Gay, of course, made both of the 59-yard uh, field goals. And then, of course, we're basically in the same position at the end of the game, which was the other fourth down conversion, which is getting a whole lot of attention for what reason. I don't fully know. It's not like we were going to win the game anyway, but there's a lot of noise about how maybe we should have kicked that field goal and taken gone for the onside kick. I kind of like the way Steichen addressed it. I'm stumbling and bumbling all over my words. Shout out to Chris Berman. I like the way that Shane Steichen addressed that post-media I or post-game. I understand what he was saying. In his mind, he said, listen, the clock is low. I don't know exactly how much time was left. I'd have to check. In his mind, he was thinking, let's get a touchdown right here. And then if we recover the onside kick, we only have to worry about getting a field goal with not a lot of clock, right? The odds you get a touchdown are slim to none. So I, I kind of get where Shane Steichen's coming from there. To me, I'm not too angry about that. But I hate to be in a situation where I'm looking at the Colts and saying, damn, can you just take the points once in a while? Because as much as you're trying to steal a drive and a possession from Jacksonville, to beat them, you're also going to have to score some points, right? Especially an offense like theirs, which is incredibly skilled. So I don't know, like, I don't know. Again, hindsight is twenty twenty, and I don't want to kind of speak out of pocket. But the, in the game, the fourth and four particularly, in my head, I was like, dude, like, kick the field goal, man. We have Matt Gay for a reason, but I don't want to come out here and, and, and make it like, because obviously Shane Steichen's in the moment. He doesn't have 
a day to think about it and come back to you. He has to make it in the moment. So I don't want to judge him for something I also would have done in the moment. But at the same time, he's the head coach and I'm not. And I have to acknowledge that. And at some point, you have to wonder, when do you put analytics aside and just kick the damn field goal and take the points? So that is my question to you. I'm curious to what you guys think about some of this fourth down stuff, because this is the direction the NFL was going in or is going in. Jacksonville themselves, I believe, was one of three or one of four on fourth down. So it wasn't just us. Doug Peterson could potentially even be credited with the first guy to make this commonplace in the NFL. And to see both teams not convert well on it, and on top of it, they were bad on third down. I mean, they left a lot of points on the table, both teams, because of going for it on fourth. So this is a discussion to be had, and I'm curious what you guys think about it. But I wanted to bring this up to kind of review a little bit of what Shane Steichen did. I think he needs to be a little bit better. I think he will be better. But let's credit him now. We're praising Anthony Richardson. Let's wrap it up here. Let's credit Shane Steichen for what we saw out of Anthony Richardson because in terms of rookie quarterbacks in their first starts, that was actually a historic performance, whether you want to believe it or not. So with that, that's the end of the episode. You made it. Thank you so much for being here. If you haven't shot it a like yet, go ahead and do so. You made it this far. You had to have liked it a little bit, right? And uh, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done that yet as well. But with that, my name is Justin. This right here was the Riding the Bench Colts cast. Go Colts.